when I was undergraduate studying off culture, there was a certain professor I had that hated snails. He believed that there was absolutely no value that they could have to them and spent great costs, great effort. And frankly, the lives of some fish, uh, dosing all kinds of medications, spiking salinity, doing everything that they could to kill snails. Now, I, I found as I've uh, grown in the aquarium industry that this hatred of freshwater snails is somewhat ubiquitous, um, but it is also to a degree a little bit of an old school thing. So today I would very much like to talk about what I believe is one of the greatest unsung heroes in freshwater aquarium keeping, and that is Planorbella, the ram's horn snail. And in this talk, I'll be briefly going into some of what's known about its biology, uh, its behavior, uh, what we know about it, and how these features play uh, into it being what I consider an ideal freshwater cleanup crew agent. So this is Tross Pluskin. Uh, I currently work at Ocean State Aquatics, and we are going to be talking about Planorbella ram's horn snails today. I found uh, doing a lot of servicing for tanks that fresh, the idea of a freshwater cleanup crew is not necessarily popular, um, though it is gaining popularity. The idea that just like a saltwater system where cleanup crews, hermit crabs, snails, are quite popular, I find that there's no real reason why the same principles where you have ex you, you, you strive to have the greatest biological complexity possible in your system, having all as many different critters eating as many different things as possible. And, and I find that when, 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 you, you, when you push your systems to have as greatest complexity as possible, eventually they'll stabilize into something that doesn't require as much manual input. So here's an example of a tank that I was rearing some baby bristlenose plecos in. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, th I didn't scrape this tank. I've never scraped this tank because simply by having so much biological activity, uh, there is no place for algae to ever build up. Uh, so really, I really do want to foster this idea of the freshwater cleanup crew or boosting the biological complexity of our systems so that we agree achieve a greater stability and through that we achieve greater beauty. There's a famous evolutionary biologist, his name is Edward O. Wilson. He has a line that I love and it's the little things that rule the world. And he's absolutely right because everything, even a, even a fish tank, a, a, a river, a, the human body, uh, the health and functioning of any great system is up to the, the, the analysis and the detail and the functioning of its, of its microscopic elements. So by having ram's horn snails in an aquaria, you really, I mean, I call, I market these things to my clients as little Roombas because what they do essentially is they're, is they're going around and they're eating all of the solids. They're eating all the uneaten feed. So anything that's like sticking out that could just rot and cause an issue, they'll, they'll head right toward that. But they're also at the same time, especially when they're getting hungry, they're scraping uh, all these sub uh, surfaces. They're scraping the glass, they're scraping the rocks, wood, filters, plastic, decor, plants, everything. Every surface in the tank, they're scraping and they're getting rid of any algae and bacteria biofilm that's forming. So when you have a, a, a messy glass on your tank, that's hundred years in algae time. They've had so much time to establish there that they are just what you, the fact that you can see it with your naked eye means that they have had generation upon generation upon generation. So by having these guys constantly just moving, just covering every surface of your tank throughout the day, you know, you're really scraping away at that biofilm to the point that algae and bacteria cannot build up to the point where you'll see it. Um, and if it does, it's, it's something that, that is, is particularly nasty, but routine, routine dirtiness will be uh, scraped up by these guys. And why having a freshwater cleanup crew is just great. Uh, stabilizes water quality, it reduces uh, uneaten feeds, and, and it just makes the tank looking nicer longer. Um, yeah, so you just, you know, you boost that, that biological stability and complexity, and, you know, you're going to get more bang for your buck as far as display for the maintenance. The genus of ram's horn snails are Planorbella, 
but there are countless species. Uh, but most of these guys are uh, from North America, with a few exceptions. But uh, Corneas is from Europe. Durii uh, is from Florida. Those are the most common that you'll see. Uh, there is, of course, the possibility that the, they have been hybridized in Aquaria. Um, so it's kind of difficult to say which brand name Planner Bella is in anyone's particular tank, uh, more or less. But it's, uh, at least to the point of my research, observed that they all operate in a similar way as far as the genus level. Now, there may be exceptions to this, but um, as a whole, uh, the Planorbidae are uh, freshwater air-breathing snails that they have basically a giant lung that they use to absorb oxygen directly from uh, the surface. These guys eventually will need to come to the surface to gasp at some air, which is, is fascinating. Um, they possess hemoglobin, which is why the, the red variation that's very popular is actually albinism that la lacks melanin, so it can't darken its shell and thus appears as bright reds. So that's fascinating. Um, so they have hemoglobin, and that is what allows them to be so robust. Even if your tank is unoxygenated, these guys will still do just fine in case it's probably a good way to get even brighter red coloration. But but yeah, they, they do just fine with that hemoglobin. And because of um, because of their ability to breed so readily in Aquaria, there have been a couple uh, different uh, color morphs of these guys. So there have been bright blue, even some pinks that have been... Uh, produced. So these guys are, are fun and fascinating, and there are different colors that come out of them. And uh, the fact that they eat, uh, breathe air uh, just makes them all the more effective at uh, being able to go in and uh, clean out the really, really nasty, dirty places of your tank. The life cycle of Planter Bella is pretty comprehensive, which is why they so readily breed in Aquaria, even without any work on behalf of the aquarist. Um, so they're hermaphroditic. Any two individuals can exchange genetic information and they can store sperm so they can re-impregnate themselves and mix the sperm around, I'm, I'm sure. And parthenogenesis may also be possible where they can just pop out babies, but I'm not quite sure. Egg globules consist of 12 to 20 eggs. They're orange to brown slash clear in color, and they will adhere to plants, glass, wood rocks, etc. There's probably a great novel, uh, adhesive to be derived from the snail egg sac because it's uh, really, really quite hard, squishy, yet not sticky at the same time. Um, yet, of course, sticks where it needs to. So that's quite fascinating. And this is often how ram swans are introduced to other people's tanks as hitchhikers, uh, whether egg sacs are on a piece of rock or plant. Um, when the larvae hatch, they are competent. They're little mini versions of the adult. They don't have any fancy plankton planktonic state or anything and uh, they're a little bit more fragile than the adults they may even be good little fish food at that point but the ones that survive will readily start eating uh, at the same uh, food items as the adults are supposedly and acquiring their gut microbiome and starting their work as little rumbas in your tank so how do ram's horn snails feed so they have a a unique snail organ called the radula, and it's essentially this tongue filled with a thousand little razor blades. You can see a micrograph of it below. And this tongue, the radula, is used to scrape at surfaces. They're selective feeders for bile films. They can chew and erode at some surfaces, but they, they're not necessarily chewing. They're not mandibles, like let's say a beetle would have, per se, or, or a shrimp. Uh, these guys have of uh, this radula, and it's, it's most adept at scraping at algae and bacterial biofilms. So that invisible hidden layer of growth, or the, the things that make rocks slippery at the, at, um, you know, at low tide. So these guys go around and they essentially scrape at that. And, uh, you know, this is where their bad rep kind of begins, where these guys are very rarely not, they just do not, for the most part, eat healthy, robust plant material. They, they will eat plant material that is dying. They'll eat plant material that's infected with some sort of bacteria or that's stressed. Um, they'll eat loose plant material that's fallen at the bottom of the tank. Um, they'll eat an algae, they'll eat bacteria, they'll eat uneaten feed, they'll eat uh, certain food pellets, um, but they will not, for the most part, eat plants. And this is why they make a very ideal cleanup crew because you can reconcile 
the fact that these guys are moving around eating feed, with the fact that the plants are also uh, stripping away at the invisible uh, dissolved nitrogenous waste. And, and also consider that these guys are essentially pooping out premium plant fertilizer and, and delivering it uh, localized right next to the roots. So uh, these guys will consume some plants in some contexts, um, but it's much more common that the average aquarium plant will be left alone with these guys. They leave alone a wide variety of the standard Anubias, Java fern, Java moss, Bacopa, uh, Crips, a variety of, 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 of species that I keep just at home. Um, but these guys, uh, for the most part, are, are specialized biofilm feeders, which is why they are very good cleanup crew. Despite some effort, I was unable to find a lot of detail uh, on the ga gastrointestinal system of Plantarbella. Um, and I would be very interested to see some of the, uh, specifically some histology on the gastrointestinal infrastructure of it to see how it could possibly uh, hold so many different types of bacteria. Because as, as we'll see, it's, it's very contextual on what the snail feeds on dictates what it seeks out to actively feed on in the future. And it's quite fascinating. This experiment by Kimberly et al. 2012, uh, I thought was quite fascinating. This was an experiment where they took naive snails and exposed them to various prey items and then tested their uh, diet and their preference uh, on feeding on prey items. And what they found is that if Snails are all naive. They'll go for things that uh, instinctually will um, give them the highest growth rates, uh, the, the, give them the, the, the most reproduction, the best nutritional value. They'll go for those prey items. But if snails are reared on, let's say, an inferior prey item and then exposed to both an inferior prey item and the, the, the prey item they're, they're used to, and a premium prey item, the one that will give them the most of everything that a naive snail would go to, these studies are suggesting that they will more often than not go to the inferior known prey item. They will go to what they know. And this suggests that the snails aren't necessarily operating under their own nutritional imperative, but rather under the imperative of the bacteria that they've acquired and incorporated into their gut microbiome. So what this study is suggesting is that the snails act under the nutritional imperative of the microbiome of which they've acquired on whatever forage they were exposed to early in life. So if this assumption is correct and is consistent as Kimberly's study suggests, this could suggest that snails uh, acting as a cleanup crew in a freshwater tank, they can be trained to acquire food items that are most agreeable with the needs of the tank. So if there's a surplus of algae in the tank that the snails are introduced to early in life, the snails will adopt gastrointestinal infrastructure to eat algae. And they will then seek out the algae or the, or the bacteria or the uneaten feed or the fungi or any particular waste item that the tank has an excess of. They will then, the tank by in and of itself having the problem will train the cleanup crew train these guys, uh, their own customized Roombas to deal with it. Obviously, this will have some limitations, and there's obviously some limitations to the plasticity, but this is very exciting as far as understanding just how we can raise customized cleanup crew to make perfect tanks. Another fascinating study, who at all, 2021. The gut microbiota of, of, of non of herbivorously fed snails were predominantly these, these microbes that were extremely competent in processing plant biomass, digesting cellulose, lignose. Um, and, and, and really it's it's fascinating when when you know the studies are just coming out now to try and quantify what exactly is going on in these suckers. And what we're finding is that not that they are in fact acquiring their own microbiome 
based on their forage and they're optimizing that microbiome and reconciling the, the nutritional needs of those bacteria with the, with the needs of them, the snail. And, and, and the result is this is highly sophisticated and efficient system of, of, of nutritional acquisition where you have this snail essentially transporting this, this highly comfortable bacteria in culture to new sites to acquire new raw materials to be acquired and redistributed to both bacterial, the bacteria and the snails. Now, what would be fascinating follow-up is to see the, the excretion of these snails and see what exactly is going on in, in the poop of these snails uh, as far as the bacteria and how that might, may or may not have a positive relationship with fish and most likely uh, aquatic plants and algae. Talk about overall benefits of plantar bella in freshwater aquariums. You're going to reduce solids. You're going to cut down your algae. You're going to take out your leftover feed, your dead plant matter. By taking out those solids, you're going to make your plants work better. You're going to make your filters work better. Just like everything, like a living Roomba. Stabilize water quality because those solids are being reduced and those filters and those plants and those other bacteria working so much better. Reduce the need of glass scraping because they're going through with that hooked radula and they're scraping off all that biofilm before it way before it can even form to a point that you can see it and uh it's providing a supplementary food source for fish and invertebrates you know i the plenty of loaches you know if you have an excess snail population plenty of loaches plenty of cichlids they'll all devour these guys so if you have a, of a, a tank that you have a cleanup crew in you can dump the excess in and and have a really you know recover all those wastes and turn them into nutrition really good stuff for your fish um, and then, yeah, they, um, yeah, these guys are good. I like them. Possible negative effects of plantar bella. Um, not many, uh, if they raise, maybe they can hurt some plants in some, some situations, but, you know, you can really trap them out and, um, you know, they're really not that bad unless you really hate looking at snails, but, um, you know, they, uh, that professor I mentioned in the beginning, he was like, oh, they carry disease. They're going to get all the fish sick. Um, to my knowledge, I did a lot of looking in and uh, monogeny and trematodes um, and maybe some other cestodes are pretty much your, your big issue when it comes to having snails as intermediate vectors, especially for, for, flit, for fish. So these are flukes. Um, the the catch is that they required intermediate host, often a wading shorebird like a heron, which is not present in most aquariums. Uh, so unless you have a very bold polydarium that's the size of a room and you have a few herons in there and you really are prioritizing the health of your catfish, um, I really don't think that uh, the, the disease question is a significant risk for anyone. But it's best in general to avoid pond-raised snails altogether as these are the only ones that could be exposed to the, the parasite and more importantly, the intermediate host that allows the parasite to transfer into the snail. And, and so it's and because of their, bi their biology and how easy they are to aquaculture and because of the cooler colors you get in tank colored cultured ones anyway, best to stick to the ones aquacultured in, in indoor tank settings. Plantar bella. Uh, have been uh, an issue as an invasive species. Uh, so they've been in introduced to quite a few different areas. Um, and it's because they can tolerate uh, a lot of different uh, temperatures, salinities, um, not too much. They can't handle much, um, but they do benefit from a little bit of general hardness. Um, they will actively survive uh, low pH tanks. However, you will see shell pitting, uh, which you can see at the bottom, which is fairly unattractive much better to have the pure red or pure colored specimens. Um, but supplementing a little bit of general hardness will rectify this um, and they will survive the acidic water, but it will reduce reproduction and uh, survival of the offspring. I'll end quickly with some potential applications of plantar bella in conventional food-based aquaculture or commercial scale ornamental aquaculture. Uh, they can easily be used uh, to reduce uneaten feed and waste in uh, pond culture or even in specialized 
uh, waste reduction reactors for recirculation aquaculture. Basically, they're a very efficient way to take all that fish waste, and then you can turn that into snail biomass, and then you can convert that into fertilizer, fish feed, animal feed, um, fish feed, particularly in the context where you have high value loach species like the patilla loach, clown loach, some of the rare loaches. Uh, other fish, including loaches, are specialized uh, snail feeders, so they will be uh, planter bella could be a very nice food resource for this and also any obligate snail feeding uh, species uh, that are reptiles or amphibians as well. Um, and they could stabilize the production of other live feeds and food species as well, just by being, being what they do. Thank you very much uh, for listening to my snail talk and try not to uh, hate them quite so much. Uh, they may in fact turn out to be an extremely uh, utilizable critter. Uh, thank you and have a good night.